All right. We are officially at 11.01, so I will kick us off. My name is Shay Quarry. I'm DCPL's Programs Manager. For those of you who may be new to DCPL, we are Washington, D.C.'s citywide nonprofit founded in 1971 that is dedicated to preserving, protecting, and enhancing the historic built environment of the nation's capital. I have a few things to go over today before we get started. I'd like to start by taking a moment to acknowledge some of DCPL's top sponsors, whose annual financial support helps underwrite free programs like this one today. They are the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities, QTAC Rock, Douglas Development Corporation, and Tunovich Associates, Bayer Blender Bell, Building Innovation Hub, EHT Traceries Inc., KCE Structural Engineers, and Quinn Evans. Thank you all for your dedication to historic preservation in DC. Moving on, I have a few other notes about how today's webinar will run. If you have a question, please use the Q&A box that is located at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and we'll go through those questions towards the end of our program. The chat will not be available during the presentations because it can be a bit distracting, but I will open the chat uh, towards the end so that you can submit any comments that you may have. For those of us who may be joining on Facebook, Zach will be monitoring your questions and sending them our way here on Zoom. And that is it. So now that I've covered uh, all of our um, different logistical aspects. I'm going to introduce our fabulous speakers. Uh, so Andy Altman is the co-founder of Five Squares Development in Washington, D.C. that developed Liz on 14th Street with Whitman Walker Health. In addition to Bond Bread, he's currently developing Strathmore Square, which is a 2000 unit transit oriented development community in North Bethesda. Andy was the director of the D.C. Office of Planning under former Mayor Anthony Williams, where he led the Anacostia Waterfront Initiative. After leaving DC, he was the deputy mayor for planning and economic development for the city of Philadelphia, and then led the London Olympic Legacy Development Corporation, which was responsible for the redevelopment of the 600 acre London Olympic Park. Andy formed Five Square Development with his lifelong best friend, Ron Kaplan, upon his return to the district in 2014. Andy is also an adjunct professor at GW. Roshi Jacobs is an associate principal with Studios Architecture, where he provides leadership on many of the firm's high profile design projects. He is committed to advancing the arts in our community as vice president of the board of directors for Cultural DC and as member of the art review panel in Montgomery County, Maryland. He recently joined Amtrak's Washington Union Station Art Advisory Committee and is currently serving as an adjunct professor at the University of Maryland School of Planning, Preservation and Architecture. Kimmy O'Rourke has over 17 years of experience working on a wide variety of projects, including master plans, mixed use developments, K through 12 schools, universities, and cultural centers in both the US and abroad. She is passionate about sustainable and social, socially responsible development, emphasizing community integration and environmental stewardship. Additionally, her work focuses on the end user, promoting human-centered design to better occupants overall quality of life. Cameo is a complex problem solver and is able to successfully steer complicated projects throughout the design process. She's adept at collaborating with multiple stakeholders, managing large teams, fulfilling agency processes, and working under various delivery methods. And those are our fabulous uh, speakers today, and I will turn it over to them. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you. Um, thank you. I think I'm... Um kicking off and uh, I guess, Hiroshi, are you the one driving or a cameo? One of you? Driving, yeah. You're driving, okay, great. Um, well, yeah, well, it's a thrill to be here um, and thank you, um, DCPL. Um, we've had a long and uh, relationship with DCPL and really appreciate the kind of collaborative um, planning that we did on this project together. We spent a lot of time with uh, DCPL and with the committees working on this to make it the best, um, you know, project that we could. And of course, DCPL has a long history with this project and actually making possible the preservation, uh, extensive preservation of two of the national landmark buildings as being responsible for landmarking them. So um, so this is a um, very important project um, in the city and very important DCPL. And we're, we're thrilled to be able to work with you. So thanks for having us um, to be able to present a little bit of what we're doing. Um, so obviously this is a you know project because this is a you know photo from Georgia and Florida Avenue um, looking up to Bond Bread um, at uh, you know the, the you can see the Bond Bread building there with the signage and the kind of uh, Ziggurat Tower that we'll talk about um, but you know have a long history uh, in this community next 
Um, our team, uh, you know, the land is owned by Howard University. Our team was selected by Howard to be the developer of the site. Um, consists of us, Five Squares, Mankiti Group, um, Bo Mankiti, um, here, the entrepreneur in the district, and Eden's uh, you know, major national retailer who's done uh, Union Market, among many other signature projects uh, in the district and nationally. So we have a really great team. Um, that brings, I think, tremendous skill sets rooted locally, um, but with, uh, you know, very broad experience. Studios, architects, you're going to hear from two of the principals uh, today. Um, um, who've been just done really wonderful work. Our Landscape Architects Land Collective, um, who were responsible for the, the design of uh, Franklin Square uh, and are doing other projects. Um, the project in total, you can see at the bottom, um, it is a very large project because it is over you know, two acres of land. Um, so it is, you know, 600,000 plus square feet of which it is, uh, you know, generally mixed use, residential, uh, retail, hotel, and a courtyard. And that's an important aspect is that, uh, is how we open up the building to create a genuine diversity and mixing of uses. Next. Um, location of the site, if you don't know, it's um, at, on Georgia Avenue uh, between Georgia and 8th, V and W. So that historic photo we saw was looking up Georgia Avenue um, uh, toward the site. Uh, Howard University, just uh, to the right, you can see Howard Medical School, the bookstore, and the main campus, um, and uh, of course the U Street Carter. So it is, you know, really a critical, critical site in terms of its position at the center of a larger district, which um, we are uh, calling the Duke District, um, because the relationship, of course, to U Street Carter, Duke Ellington, and the history of jazz and many in important institutions within the area. Um, but it really um, sits at the center of an area that's undergoing and continues to have significant transformation um, in the district. Next. Um, just some just some photos just to show some of the history from the U Street is, of course, being the center um, of culture and particularly African culture in this city, um, going back uh, quite a ways. Um, the, uh, of course, the riots that happened in 1968 and the transformation uh, of the Carter, which led to, you know, kind of a significant, unfortunate decline in many ways. Um, the city has a very rich history, of course, with Howard University. It's a picture of homecoming, but, you know, one of the most important institutions in our country um, that anchors this district um, that we're very much um, proud to have been selected by them and to and how they'll be a part of this project. And then you can see the bond red uh, rendering, which we'll talk about in terms of the future going forward. But again, we're trying to bring some of this very important that we understand the history uh, underlying um, uh, this important uh, site. Um, the buildings themselves, um, you know, both of which were um, nominated and are national landmarks, um, they are very significant in terms of their history. The, the Bonbread uh, building, um, the one on the left, Continental Baking Company, Bonbread Factory, um, designed by uh, Comstock, was used as a production distribution facility for bond bread. So a really a, you know, a vertical production facility. It is one of many across the country that was a prototype. Uh, so really, um, you know, uh, really, you know, very few, uh, very iconic buildings across the country. Um, and, uh, you know, a history being sold to the district and transferred to Howard University um, that uh, allowed this redevelopment to happen. To the right is the uh, what's called the RECO Garage, the elect Washington Electric Company, uh, Transit Company Central Bus Garage, 1930. It was designed by Arthur Heaton, many buildings here. Uh, local transit companies, um, you know, were centered there. Um, and so it's really significant in terms of, you know, the evolution of the city, the city's infrastructure, introduction of buses, um, and, uh, and being a very significant, um, both architecturally as a, uh, as the way that um, the garages were built in that day. Um, it had been largely vacant, both of these buildings, uh, for a number of years, sadly, have become very deteriorated and blighted over time, which has been a real cause of concern for the community. And of course, for DCPL is to see the kind of, you know, demolition by neglect that was happening just by virtue of, of you know, there not being uses there. So um, there have been many tries at the redevelopment of this. It's very complicated. Um, but we now are uh, on a path um, to bring these um, buildings back to life and this back back to productive reuse. Next. 
Um, here's the existing site plan. So Georgia Avenue, V, W, and 8th. Um, you're looking, you know, at the top of the building, as you can see, the bus garage to the left between V Street and kind of over to where Bond Bread, where the party wall is. You can see the roof there because essentially it was just a very large shed with a facade with a, you know, just very large open area to accommodate the buses and the operations and the maintenance, which of course meant that there was also significant environmental issues um, related to the site that made it very complicated and make it complicated. You can see the Bond Bread building there that then fronts on W Street. Um, you know, this area is changing, you know, quite a bit, as we said, even the lot to the north of W where there are cars parked there, um, that is going to be redeveloped um, and is in the process developer selected and moving forward of what will be a residential as well as um, uh, a research and uh, facility um, office. That's a full block. Um, many other buildings, Atlantic Plumbing, of course, is the other side of 8th Street. That's from a number of years ago. But many of the other lots that you can't see here are all being redeveloped into thousands of units um, around this district. But when I said where the anchor is, because you can see our positioning within this district in relation both to Howard and to the uh, transforming neighborhood. Next. Um, just an elevation looking, these are just some photos to give you some context, looking up Georgia Avenue, the RECO, the bottom photo, Bond Bread, uh, and you can see at the top what that elevation looks like. Next. Um, here's looking again toward up 8th Street, you see Atlantic Plumbing to the left, RECO to the right. It does show you that there is significant density. We learned a lot with the Historic Preservation Office. Um, in terms of the context of what's happening in development in the neighborhood and balancing between the preservation of those significant elements, um, historic elements of the buildings with the fact that an area that is accommodating and is appropriate for more density given its relationship to Georgia Avenue as a major corridor, as well as the nearby metro station uh, in this area. Thanks. Um, this is the W Street uh, facade. You're looking... Um, along that wall from Georgia Avenue over to 8th. Next. Uh, this is looking up 8th Street. Uh, 8th Street is very Atlantic Plumbing to the left. More intimate, smaller street, but you can see the frontage along of Reco and Von Bread on the right side of 8th Street. Um, so, uh, you know, as we look, what's very interesting about this site is that each of these streets has a very different character that we try to take advantage of, both in terms of what I see Amalia's here from Eden's, what we'll do with the ground floor retail to create a very vibrant uh, streetscape and street activity, uh, as well as um, how we treat uh, the different historic facades. Next. Uh, this just gives you a look at the interior, you know, going into Bond Bread, you can see some of the columns uh, that are here. Also, you can see, sadly, there's just, you know, been a lot of uh, just deterioration uh, in terms of looking at what can be preserved. Next. Some just some more photos. Next. Yeah, and these are some we you will see when uh, studios goes through what we try to accomplish in terms of um, preserving some of the key historic elements, these mushroom columns uh, that are in Bond Bread. Bond Bread would be, I should have said, in terms of uses, Bond Bread will be location of, uh, of what the of the hotel use. Um, and so, uh, you know, the ability to re, um, to preserve as many of these columns as we could, so they could be a part of what we think could be a really wonderful spaces within the hotel. This is the RECO garage, again, very big open span. Once you get into the building, essentially you have the brick facade, um, and then inside is just a big interior space. And what we wanted to do in our preservation goals was, um, create a public space um, so that when you entered into the RECO building, the redeveloped RECO building, you'd be able to experience some of that openness, which relates very much to what the retail spaces, the public spaces, hence the importance of the landscape architect in this and Eden's work on activation of the ground floor and programming. And we do keep not all, but some of these trusses so that it does um, you know, evoke what the history of this was. The guiding principles, then, these are, there's a lot. I'm not going to read all of these, but I think that, the, you know, um, because we had a lot of goals and objectives, but, um, but you know, these were really important. These really are guiding principles, not just something we um, 
created just uh, just to have them on a page. Um, we really did, when going back to that history, have studied the history a lot, both in terms of the cultural history, um, as well as the uh, architectural history. So how that's brought together in programming, how it's brought together in terms of the architecture, you will see that shortly. Um, we want this to be a gathering place. Um, it's very important, many of the buildings that are being built in this neighborhood in Shaw and in this district uh, very much are, you know, just building out the full block and they have ground floor retail, but there is no really central open public space, bringing people into these buildings to experience you know, the wonderful architecture, but also as a place of gathering for the different neighborhoods where we can celebrate both the history and the community today are going to be very, very important elements and make this an important anchor for the whole neighborhood in terms of the public realm. So it, we want this to set also very important architectural standards. So uh, Studios, Studios has done a wonderful uh, design for this, um, respecting both the historic, but also with a modern design, uh, not trying to mimic um, the historic character of these buildings, but actually have a building that, um, you know, is a modern building that offers a, 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 a um, sympathetic contrast. Next. Um, just going back, and this is, um, I think what I have, Hiroshi, one or two more slides for me. Yeah. So just tell me when you'll stop. Um, the Duke plan, um, this uh, on a personal note was uh, important. Uh, this was produced 2004. Um, which largely just ages, um, you know, ages me, but um, which uh, I was the planning director under Tony Williams when we produced this plan with Tony Griffin in the department and others um, working with the community and the ANCs and all the different community organizations had quite an extensive planning process to come up with the Duke plan, um, which was for the entire district. And it was at that moment an important plan because the area was starting to experience change and we're really looking at the important history, particularly the African-American history of this community. Um, the loss of institutions was happening with, you know, jazz clubs are starting to already um, move. Uh, you know, there's a lot of redevelopment happening and looked at how we could promote uh, both preservation of key buildings, but also a district, an area that would evolve as a coherent district. Um, and so hence we've been saying the Duke district because we look at this not just as a single building, but as a whole area, if you go to the next slide. Um, and that was important. That was important to Howard when they had the request for proposals, they actually asked for how will your proposal meet the objectives of the Duke district were, which uh, were about understanding the history, about culture, about um, historic preservation, cultural identity, bringing people together and creating a coherent neighborhood. And so this is um, this just gives you a, you know a little inset of that, but it just shows you uh, where the Bond Red Building. And importantly, you'll see at Georgia Avenue between W and V. You know, for us, creating a very vibrant mixed-use building, you know, that's hotel, that's that's retail, that's housing, that has significant public space in these areas, which you'll see. Um, was really part of anchoring this district, which was a vision for the Duke plan. So some you'll see that there's green above there on W Street, having some open space, given there's not a lot of open space, that's not on our lot, but on the lot um, above us called lot three, um, having opening up our building so it's not a super block, but actually can bring people into it. So it has porosity and public space and really centering it at at this district. So hence you see the green and bond bread, you see the green above that says 1.4K, um, you see the mix of ground floor uses of retail. So it really does become a center of, of this district. I think with that, that turn it over to you guys, right? Yeah, and Andy, would you mind speaking to this this slide, the, the RFP and historic preservation recommendation? Yeah, I mean, I'll quickly just speak to this, which is that, um, there were a number in the RFP. Uh, it was um, important to Howard. They worked with the Historic Preservation Office, um, the city and the district uh, with uh, to establish objectives going in because of the history. There had been an unfortunate history where there was a lot of demolition that had been proposed or almost total demolition proposed in many cases uh, in prior proposals. Um, hence, that's what led to the DCPL and the community's nomination of these buildings as National Historic Landmarks. Um, which they are, and um, so they wanted to be very clear with developers that there were preservation objectives and what those were. So you'll see those, I won't 
really go, go through all of them, but you know, a lot of it is about, um, you know, for example, what are the key features? The ziggurat roof line of Bond Bread was very important. Uh, making sure that there are, you know, the setbacks uh, from Bond Bread to the new building, so that that ziggurat was enhanced and was was identifiable as part of its architectural identity. Um, uh, you'll see um, that, uh, for example. Um, design and massing should consider each building separately so that you can have a different response for RECO than you can you, you could have for bond bread. Um, at RECO, it was that, you know, it was important in terms of the overall facade of the uh, perimeter of the building as a bus garage. You could have density above it and it could be significant, but wanted to understand that that ground floor, that facade was preserved and also creating an interior, creeping, you know, some of that open space in the interior was very important. Um, as opposed to what normally would happen if it were just um, typical development by zoning is you would fill out the whole box with one big massing. So that's why actually you lose density, but it opens up that bond bread, which you'll set, I'm sorry, the reco, so that there is an open space. So you could preserve some trusses and the sense of what that interior was like. So these were, there are many other features, but these were some of the key things. And you'll see um, what we did our historic preservation plan with Emily I and came up with how we could make sure to keep some of those key um, historic defining features, whether that's in the interior of those mushroom columns that we showed, the ziggurat structure, trusses, um, setbacks, a number of ways that we wanted to uh, make sure the preservation was a foundation of what we're um, creating. And this is just, I'll, I'll end on this, which is, you know, through an extensive community process, um, we had tremendous support at all levels, which we're really um, proud of and worked very hard um, with the community, starting with the ANCs and all the different civic organizations, the council member, the Preservation League. We had very intensive work sessions, which were wonderful. I mean, it was we actually had a designed a process where we sat down and went step by step through our design, incorporated modifications, made changes, really tried to make sure we were you know, given the long support of DCPL to see this um, project happen and done in a, a sensitive way, um, making sure those were incorporated, uh, working with HPO staff, also through a kind of workshop process because of the sensitivity of the buildings. And ultimately, we gained HPRB approval uh, uh, last year uh, on September 29th. And uh, we we're really, really excited about that because it was just so well received by the community, by DCPL. Um, and people really wanted to see this, these buildings that have just been sitting there sadly neglected for so, so, so long in the middle of an area that's redeveloping, but being done in the right way. And we're proud that our, the team that here um, is able to deliver that um, for the community. Great, well, thanks. Thanks, Andy. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, Cami and I, we're gonna, we'll take you through sort of our more specific design solutions to the, to the project. Uh, requirements and goals that that Andy just outlined. Um, so just you know, just starting with the neighborhood, I think Andy spoke very eloquently about how this site is a nexus in the neighborhood that really connects Howard University and the surrounding neighborhoods and all the change that's happening in this in this area. Um, and so one of our key uh, considerations and goals with this project is, as he said, to create a public space that is really um, used by everyone in the community um, and really celebrate the legacy of this site uh, being a, a, a gathering place in the neighborhood. Uh, you know, Andy mentioned um, the Howard homecoming that is traditionally uh, something that happens in the big parking lot um, just north of our site, um, which is also being redeveloped at this time. So um, really focusing on the site as a public space, a public a development that uh, really invites people in uh, in to use the site as a whole. Um, so this is a, an axon a diagram that really shows um, the creation of this public space and public experience that makes its way through the site. Um, you know, the, the historic building facades have a lot of character. Um, but also the interior of these buildings uh, have a lot of character and, and we wanted to make sure that um, the public and people are able to experience not only the perimeter of the site, but also the interior of the site. Um, so people can really um, experience what it was like to, um, to, to, to move in and through and around these buildings um, and really create a sense of porosity through the site. 
Um, so we have a, a public space that's open to Sky, but there's also a public experience through the retail, through the hotel experience um, from, from both sides of the site, really kind of driving traffic, uh, not around the site, but through it. And then of course we have, um, you know, we have new development that's happening on the site to, to make it viable for the future. And, but we wanted to make sure that there was also ver uh, vertical porosity uh, throughout the site to bring in light and air. And, and again, to allow people to experience the, the three-dimensional qualities of these existing buildings through the massing um, and development of the new structures uh, that are being built above these, uh, above these existing buildings. As Andy mentioned, uh, the site is being uh, developed uh, to a high level of density. These surrounding sites, you can see um, through these diagrams, are really zoned for um, and, and appropriately being developed um, for um, many housing units and, and mixed use developments. Um, but we wanted to, with this development, to be to 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 add density to the site, but also be respectful of the historic buildings. Um, so you can see the, the change in density from some of the surrounding developments to our site, how there's far less um, a new construction above the existing buildings, and they really kind of respect the massing and skyline of those existing historic buildings on the site. Um, so this diagram just shows kind of what this, the development might have looked like on the, on the left-hand side if, if the development was maximized in terms of its um, zoning allowed uh, density on the site. Uh, but again, we wanted to be respectful of the historic building, so um, we started carving back and re removing density from the site really to, to um, allow the buildings to be set apart from and respectful of those historic facades. And then also making some tweaks. Also making. I'm getting a little bit of feedback. There we go. Um, also um, making a few tweaks to the massings to allow for uh, for the massing to really um, to really emphasize the some of the, the the qualities of the historic building. You can see the ziggurat massing of the Bond Bread Building and centering the the hotel bar on that. Uh, making some inflections in the in the building above the Reco building to to respect some of the massing moves of that historic building. So here you see a rendering rendering of the new construction um, looking up Georgia Avenue. This is the V Street facade. You can see how we've um, we've really maintained the skyline of the historic building, so you can really get a sense of the shape. And the, and the three dimensional qualities of the building, the RECO building here, by setting uh, the new construction apart from it and really creating a high degree of contrast in the materiality of the new construction. What we wanted to do with the architecture was, again, respect the historic material and, and, and shape, um, but create a new, more modern expression that, that also has uh, compatibility with that historic. Um, so we're proposing a brick um, industrial uh, type architecture above. And it's set apart from the historic building with this kind of darker um, darker metal gasket architecture in between. This is a view looking down Georgia and at the new W Street connection through here. Uh, the bond bread structure, as you can see here in the middle with its ziggurat massing. The hotel structure above, um, which is um, which we want to again create a, a high degree of contrast here. So we have the lighter brick of the historic building, and then we're going with a, a darker and more glassy look with the hotel um, that is set back from the from the Georgia Avenue facade quite a bit um, to allow for relief and expression of that historic skyline. Here you see a view looking down 8th Street um, with W Street here in the foreground, the entrance to the hotel, really again, respecting the, the skyline of the historic building. Um, this area of the new construction is residential units. Um, so it, it's, it's uh, differentiated from the hotel going with a darker brick um, idea, um, but also creating that high degree of contrast between the new and the and the historic uh, with these facades here on this side. Hi. Um, so after the, the 
uh, orientation that you've gotten from seeing the building from each of the different perimeter uh, renderings, I think we want to walk through and show how we really look to illuminate, as Andy said, the RFP preservation considerations that um, throughout the design and how our design really does look to reinforce or bring these to life, each of these recommendations. So we have a set of diagrams here. You can see that from the beginning, um, the team had always prioritized the perimeter facades and retaining them, but it really became um, uh, important throughout you know, the entire process, especially working with different agencies, that the importance of actually preserving portions of the interior of each of these buildings too. So for instance, you can see the pieces um, in pink of the bond bread, um, not that are perpendicular, that are perpendicular to Georgia Avenue. So retaining not only exterior elements, but also the elements within. Additionally, we're going to be, sorry, Hiroshi, can you go back for one sec? Um, keeping the uh, fenestration patterns at the perimeter, but enlarging them to create an active pedestrian experience at the street level. And typically this means dropping the existing sill at locations that would allow for interior exterior connections and additional retail opportunities. <clears throat> okay, next, thanks. Um, uh, we brought up the party wall, and so the importance of the party wall between the historic structures is really emphasized in our final design. It's actually two separate walls, one for the RECO side and one for the bond bread, and they have their own uh, material characteristics. And while they are uh, interior elements in their historic configuration as we speak right now, in our design that we really are aiming to display them on the exterior as something the public can interact with. <clears throat> um, and then the design, as we said, has evolved throughout the entire process. And one of them, one of the pieces is the addition of some additional trusses within the design. And so you can see here um, the pink lines. We had accounted for keeping five trusses at the south. So uh, the, the, sorry, where you enter off of V Street, but throughout processes with uh, historic, um, sorry, with HPO and DCPL and other civic groups, we uh, have now incorporated two at the north. And so it's, as you guys all know, this, the industrial um, volume of RECO is very, uh, is not something very typical within Washington DC, these industrial spaces. And so keeping that volume and having some sort of remnant of, of what its larger space was, was very important. So these trusses serve to give you the full north south extension of what that volume is <clears throat> in its original condition. Okay, next. <clears throat> Um, as Andy did illuminate, the setbacks became a very important thing, and Hiroshi already ran through how the massing evolved to um, make the historic structure stand out. So we pushed a lot of the density to 8th Street, which is a smaller, less prominent facade. Um, both of the residential bars, a uh, frame V Street, and the pediment at the entry into the park. You can see here that um, putting the residential bar above RECO, we have set it back and created an inflection point, which is at the central axis. So allowing the building to be symmetrical above the historic facade and giving the historic facade more prominence. Similarly, the hotel bar is set um, symmetrically above the bond bread ziggurat, and it is also set back to let bond bread stand out um, and be prominent, similar to what how it was shown in that 1949 um, image that you saw at the beginning. And Hiroshi, I think, explained this pretty well, uh, utilizing um, facade expression as another preservation strategy to reinforce the historic building's prominence. And so uh, here you can see the pink, which was the lighter brick color that he showed for the residential. Uh, the hotel is a um, darker metal to contrast the bond bread white brick. And then the facade number three is what would be along the perimeter from W down to onto 8th Street acting as a gradient between the two um, more prominent facades. And um, given the complexity of this project, it's been very imperative for us to continually present visuals that the public or other stakeholders could easily understand from the very beginning without having any prior knowledge of the project. So we've developed 
many diagrams um, working in conjunction with the development team, our structural engineers, uh, the historic consultants, EHT, traceries, like Andy mentioned, HPO, DCPL. And so these um, demolition diagrams really became something very important to how we would explain the project. And so they aim to show you the elements that are being removed due to loss of structural integrity and for RECO uh, due to contamination. Um, then they show elements which are being removed to make the new development viable. Um, number three shows the remaining historic fabric. And then number four, what we're reconstructing in kind, either from elements that were had lost their structural integrity or um, for other reasons. So this was done for every floor of both buildings, and they really became a labor of love in our office. There's one particular employee of ours who definitely loves all the iterations he did, but I think that they have been extremely valuable in um, helping us to actually find additional pieces of the building that could be retained. Um, originally, we thought that the we would need to demolish more than we do. And so they really helped prove that this is a preservation project and helped us um, find all of those pieces to keep in the, in the final build. One of the character defining features of RECO, as we said, is the overall volume and those steel trusses were very important. So um, we looked at different ways that we could keep the entire volume given uh, looking to keep an, adequate amount of density on the site too. So here you can see four different versions of how we could incorporate the full length, either through carving out pieces of the building or actually piercing into the, uh, um, into the facade and making the truss a part of the interior space. And so if you go to the next slide, <clears throat> we reviewed a lot of these um, diagrams with community organizations and, and other agencies. And this is the final configuration that we uh, landed on where to the east side of the project we are carving out and then at the yep perfect thanks and then to the left uh, we are piercing into the structure so these trusses will really become a part of the retail space and add different a nicer preservation characteristic to them as as interesting features uh, here you can see a north-south section of where they are, so the five at the south off of the Fee Street entrance, and then the two additional trusses that were added at the um, northern courtyard, which are right alongside the party wall, giving you the full north-south extent of the RECO original space. And because we love our trusses, here's a plan of them too, so you can see their extents and where they are in the overall um, courtyard site. So um, here we are entering into the courtyard. So this is, you know, probably the most prized space of the of the project. This is just off of V Street and it's really the heart of of the building. So we envision this as a vibrant, welcoming public space where there it can be drawing people in from not only the building, but the surrounding neighborhood and hopefully the whole city really acting as a destination. The retail will spill out onto the courtyard, as you can see here, um, and it's envisioned to hold different types of events such as concerts and festivals. You can also see at the back, the trusses, um, the tr two trusses at the back, really how the whole space is brought together. And then turning around, you can see the V Street pediment um, and uh, where the existing openings have been enlarged to allow a really welcoming historic entry threshold. And this is really the Duke plan that Andy sort of went through, realized as a green public amenity where we're hoping to, you know, draw everybody in to the center of the site. Moving to the north, you can see the two additional trusses that we discussed earlier. And uh, there's a retail jewel box underneath the residential bridge. I'd like to also highlight, you can see some potential locations for artwork. We're looking to make uh, artwork a focus of the project too, and hopefully tap into local artists, perhaps with a direct connection to Howard University. And so we have started identifying multiple opportunities throughout the site where this could happen. This is turning around so you can see the two party walls uh, with their different materiality because of their existing brick. And so the pediment of RECO, 
and the uh, bond bread that uh, enters above. And then the um, this is also the threshold entering into the bond bread existing area, um, which will be hotel and retail space. So going through those those thresholds here, you can see Bond Bread's hotel lobby, and this space really encompasses the project's historic character and allows you to get um, very up close and personal with each of these elements, such as the mushroom columns, which we all really love, um, different parts of the historic original structure, and you can see through the party wall, or sorry, through the skylights up to the existing party wall above. So this is what Hiroshi was also really telling you about, bringing people through the center of the site. You can see down through V Street and really gives you a connection all the way north-south through the through this site. And another way to make the site porous, we have a alley entryway off of Georgia Street. So to the right is the party wall. So this is basically mid block. And so this acts as a, um, a nice passageway giving you access as you come down Georgia and really allowing the project to be a cut through if you're going from the east to the west um, of of the city through through this area. So this is also another opportunity to highlight the party wall and see how the two buildings came together. There will also be retail on either side of this passage really activating its pedestrian stuff. And so um, harking back to how the project has really benefited through the process of working with different agencies, you can see here in the background, the location of the hotel tower above the Bond Bread Ziggurat and um, we did a lot of different studies and worked with HPO and DCPL looking at how the best placement of this tower um, to give Bond Bread the prominence that we saw in that earlier photograph. And you can see in the next image where we landed with our final configuration. So I'd just like to wrap up and say that it was, I think a the project has evolved in so many wonderful ways throughout um, the process. And I think a lot of that is, is thanks to the organizations that we got to work so closely with, such as DCPL and HPO um, and our consultants along the way. So we'd like to give a, a thanks to everyone for that. And I think that wraps up. So I guess if anybody else on our team has anything to add, I guess we'd be ready for questions. And I'll just I'll just uh, recognize Amalia from Edens is has joined us, um, so she she's been an integral part of this uh, of this uh, project and can help us answer questions if there are any. We do. Thank you so much. That was great. Our our first question uh, is about the general construction schedule, anticipated dates of completion for this project. So I believe our anticipated date, and maybe Amali or Andy, you guys could speak to this, would be summer 2027, is that right? So construction will start Q4 of 2026. And we're anticipating um, that to be three years from then. Thanks. You're welcome. Our other question uh, is about the barriers to outdoor climate. So can you clarify where the barriers are to outdoor climate for the various units of the development? Um, this person sees a lot of open air spaces and is curious kind of where the barriers are um, in the flow of the building. I can I can answer that we we do have a, a fair amount of outdoor space in the development, the large public um, public plaza area that you can see um, through these openings here, uh, but all of the retail spaces at the ground floor um, will will have exterior uh, walls and, and you know, glass fenestration to to provide um, you know that weatherproof enclosure. Um, we are showing some operable. Um, doors and and uh, bifold type uh, type doors in some of the retail spaces. 
which would be opened um, on nice days when the weather is when when the weather is great, uh, but be able to be closed down um, if if not. Um, so uh, all of the interior spaces of the, of the project will be designed to to be able to be um, to be weatherproofed and and closed down if if needed. Okay, cool. Uh, our other question is, what are some of the challenges uh, in working with buildings um, that have been neglected or that maybe have some structural issues? What are some of the challenges? With um, I can start and Hiroshi, maybe you could jump in, but I think some of them are, especially when there's pieces of the structure or the building that you really are excited about, but you found out that they're not in as best quality as, as they could be. And so looking at the, the balance between does it make sense to rehabilitate it or to, um, or to take it down or to reconstruct it in some cases. So I think really you're trying to balance a lot of different things between budget preservation and the final design and how that can all come together. Yeah, and on the on the technical side, um, we uh, work with a lot of engineering consultants, um, and one of the consultants that we work with, um, that they're, they're able to go in and you know take samples of the existing structural slabs and beams and columns, um, and analyze them from a scientific perspective, uh, understanding the years of of water infiltration um, and the the structural capacity of those those existing structural elements, and provide recommendations for either um, you know fixing them, providing additional support, um, or suggesting that they that they are beyond repair and need to be removed or and replaced. I'd also uh, pull into this uh, sustainability since you know, as our codes have changed and, and the things that we're trying to do with buildings has changed over the years. Sometimes how a building will react to additional levels of insulation or, or air infiltration, older buildings can be leakier. How you deal with that and really bring them back up to code can be a challenge, but also very important for, you know, still retaining them, but um, being cognizant of our environmental restrictions right now. Great. Uh, let me look. Oh, we have another question. Um, what is the estimated uh, cost of this project, if you are willing to share that? <laughs> That's an Amalia question, if we're... Um, at this moment, we are still trying to um, identify where we can um, figure out ways to cut costs. So. I don't think that we're able to give that a true cost at this moment. Right, uh, we have another question about uh, some of the historic photos and design slides. And this individual is wondering if uh, you will display any of those images in the hotel and or the courtyard. Um, I think that's a great idea. I think we're going to be working with a lot of different consultants from art consultants and um, working with other Eden's retail and how all of this gets incorporated. I believe that the project really is uh, wedded to the historic nature, not of just of these buildings, but of the neighborhoods. So any way that we can start incorporating the history into the project is always uh, something we're looking to do. We don't exactly know of exactly how we're going to do that right now, though. We're studying it. <laughs> uh, another question about uh, the hotel. Do you have a specific uh, hotel group identified or is that still being worked out? We are working with a hotel developer. Um, whether the specific group is solidified is um, still under consideration. Right. 
I think those are all of our questions. Anyone? Oh, we have one more. Oh, it's just a it's just a compliment. It's a really brilliant project. <laughs> Thank you. And it is. It's been great. And it's been so great to hear about. Um, and if we get any other questions, you can always uh, email me. I'll be sending out um, a final email with the recording of this webinar. Uh, and if you have any final pressing questions, you can always send them to me and I will connect you to our panelists. Uh, but thank you all for being here. Thank you again to our panelists. This was such a great presentation and such a great uh, thing to look back on. And uh, I'm excited to see, see the final project in, in a few years from now. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. Anytime. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Take Thank care. You.